Next, we have a panel uh, consisting of Emils, Philip, and Lisa. Uh, and they will be looking at the challenges and opportunities of leveraging big data in healthcare and life sciences. for this so uh, uh, yeah so thanks a lot um, good afternoon so um, I think it'll be quite okay I will sit down actually so, <laughs> so uh, I think it'll be quite interesting panel discussion since we gathered like quite a cross-disciplinary uh, people representatives out here so uh, we'll both speak today about how big data uh, can leverage and transform healthcare and life sciences so uh, I will, rep I will basically introduce very quickly myself. My name is Emil Sindikov. I will be representing more technical parts, so putting ahead of computer scientists here working in healthcare. So uh, we have uh, Lisa altman Reher from Bupa, and she will be speaking about healthcare policy and data-driven decisions, but she will make a quick presentation afterwards. And also Philip Arendt from Bayer, working on a, as a lawyer there with data privacy and consent. So I think we'll tackle quite a lot of questions here. So why we're here actually is that uh, for sure, we, we spoke about quite a lot of different examples today and, and yesterday as well. So how we can basically see the benefit of leveraging and working with data and seeing the, the hidden value out of it. And for sure, life sciences and healthcare, and healthcare is one of, the, one of the quite priorities for the society because we all want to live longer with a, with a high quality of life and also see the benefit in, in other subsections. So that's uh, quite an interesting thing because we tackled, uh, we, we, what we tackled first of all is uh, the question of uh, the lack of data. So we as a technical persons and having companies with technical backgrounds went to the, to the, to the spheres and the industry with a question of how we can gather and harvest the data in order to uh, end the question of this black box. So just a quick example if we're speaking about healthcare so when the patient comes into hospital, it's quite you know evident what to do with him. He can always the doctor can always send him to the, to do the lab examination. He can examine him by himself and get some get some answers to the questions. But what happens outside of this black box, outside the hospital with the walls and and uh, which is a closed environment? This was one of the questions that we tried to tackle from a technical background. What is a quite controversial? The second question that we tackled is the oversaturation with data. So we gather and harvest quite a lot of data. I think the previous speaker also mentioned about why we're speaking about big data, because we have quite a lot of sensors, IT infrastructure, such as uh, quite, quite, a, quite a good power of processing and sending the data. So uh, the, 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 second, the second question we'll tackle is basically the oversaturation, meaning that there is so much data, that it's quite hard to basically see what matters. You know, you can see the parallel of, I don't know, like a human being standing in LA during rush hour and like, you know, among thousands of cars uh, going across and, and, you know, try to find the right cab to, to go into and have a right. Uh, and the third question we will tackle is uh, basically uh, that previous speakers tackled already is the data, data privacy and ownership stuff. So basically um, how we can, uh, how we can diver differentiate what is the hidden values there, especially when we're speaking about health and life science because we still cannot calculate the exact value when we gather the data from individuals or, the, or a group of individuals. And so how we can basically uh, both provide incentive to people to better understand, to better involve in the process by not saying the exact price and value, the exact incentive they can get, and both see uh, how we can basically change the whole, the whole data flow and the whole infrastructure so in order to spread the value not only among the stakeholders but also among the data owners. Because if we look at ourselves, we can also perceive not us not only as a human being and not as an environment ar around ourselves, but from a technical background, we can perceive ourselves as a great, um, great source of data. So, uh, just a couple of couple of couple of uh, numbers, and Lisa will elaborate qu quite better about this. So, um, from one of the Stanford Medical School reports, so uh, in in 2013, 153 exabytes of data were processed in the healthcare industry. So I'm not wrong, I think. Yeah, so uh, one exabyte is one billion gigabytes. So you can imagine just a simple movie is a one and a half 
gigabytes, so you can imagine how much data do we have there. And it, by 2020, the, uh, they uh, basically see that it will be more than 2,000 exabytes of data, which is quite a huge number. And we should definitely work with this because we cannot wait for a society you know, to be 100% ready to accept the technology because we're still here. We would like to live longer with a higher quality of life and have the benefits today, not you know, in 200 years. So, uh, okay, so I won't take too much of time. I would like to have this as an open discussion. We'll have a couple of controversial questions, so we'll try to involve you with a quick poll that Lisa will make. So I'll pass the word to Lisa to have a couple of slides in order to warm up the audience. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the introduction, Emil, and thanks to all of you for hosting me in Latvia. It's great to be among such company and to hear such interesting discussion over the past um, yesterday and, of course, this morning, and looking forward to later on as well. So, yeah, as Emil said, I'm going to share for approximately 10 minutes some thoughts about big data in healthcare, in particularly focusing on predictive models and the opportunities we have to use them in the healthcare space. And then I'll pass on to Philip after that, who can share some thoughts from a life science and crop science perspective as well. So just a bit about me. So I, you can see it up on the screen. And then over the course of the presentation, I'm going to be drawing on some of the research that I've done, both academically and for the actuarial profession on wearable health technologies, and also the role of predictive models in healthcare and data science. So. Before I get started, I thought we could just do perhaps a quick poll of the room for who in the room would be willing to share their wearables data or their mobile app data with their doctor or a member of their health team. If you would be willing to let your doctor have um, access to your wearables data, you know, your heart rate. Yeah, I don't know, I can spot some of you with your hands up maybe with a, with a wearable tracker on as well um, in the audience. Okay, um, and now, so that was pretty much uh, the majority of the room. But I'm wondering who of you that did put your hands up, would you be willing for your employer to access that same data about you, your health data, your wearables data? I don't, I don't spot any hands. Occasionally you do get um, one or two people when, it, when I've done this before. Um, so that's very interesting. So there's clearly a need in the room to control exactly who is accessing our data. And I think we'll draw that out in some of the discussions later as well. So I thought for a couple of minutes, it will be worth just focusing on what data sources we have, so what's out there in a health context. And this isn't an exhaustive list, but I like to think of this in three categories. So the first category is your health service data, and this is perhaps a more traditional source of data that we have in this field. So maybe electronic patient records data or patient admissions data, that would fall under that first category. And that's typically quite structured data. It might have a nice tabular linear format. But of course, now we're getting the opportunity to leverage big data that's much less structured. So you could see x-rays, for example, or freeform text coming into this category as well. So the second category then is everyday data. We mentioned the, the wearable technology, the mobile app data. So that would fit under here, even the social media data. So any form of data that's being recorded about individuals as we go about our everyday lives. And thirdly, genomic data. So this isn't being leveraged, as far as I know, in very widespread predictive models in healthcare at the moment. But long term, if we can improve our deep learning techniques to help model whole genome data sets and potentially integrate this genomic data alongside the everyday data and the health service data, then we have a real opportunity to incorporate this in predictive models that can be a lot more rounded as well and more predictive based on genomics. So that's the theory, and there are already examples of how each of these data sets are being leveraged in healthcare for prediction. And you can see some of the great benefits that that's bringing up on the screen. I'd like to focus in on a couple of examples at a high level. And um, my blog, healthactorial.com, I've done a recent blog post on 
in more depth some of the issues as well. So if you want to know more, you can refer you to that. We're happy to discuss some more examples in the Q&A later. I'm sure Philip and Emma will have lots of examples from their fields of how they're already using big data in a health and life science context. So I'd like to focus in on, firstly, the Australia example of improving patient flow around the health service. So there have been researchers there that have built a model in 27 hospitals in Queensland, Australia. And this model has been built based on 10 years' worth of hospital admissions data. And combining this with a few other data sources like public events or times of the year when outbreaks of disease are most likely to happen. And based on this, they've been able to build a really powerful prediction model for forecasting down to the hour when patients are going to arrive at these hospitals. And what's more is that they can categorize this by gender as well as condition type and severity. So some really powerful prediction tools that are then being used by the hospital bed managers at these hospitals to help plan resources at the hospital for the coming week. And this model has been very successful and there's been interest at a national level in scaling this up potentially. Uh, and you can see that could be really valuable because if you're able to predict a spike in demand for the health service, particularly in certain hospitals or regions, then you can adjust the flow of your patients around the health service accordingly to make sure that resources are able to match demand. The second example I'd like to focus on is predicting and controlling epidemics. So there's been an unlikely use of NASA satellite system, weather forecasting data in this one. So the NASA satellite system allows rainfall forecasts to be predicted within 10 kilometer radius. And by combining this with other data like population density, access to clean water in the region in Yemen, they've been able to actually build a really powerful predictive model for the risk of cholera outbreaks. And this model can predict cholera outbreaks up to four weeks in advance at the moment. And that's got huge potential not only to predict epidemics, but to start to prevent them as well. So health workers can be sent to those regions in Yemen where the outbreaks of cholera are most likely. And you can start to provide sanitation advice, chlorine tablets, proactive measures to limit the spread of disease. And what's quite exciting and what they're working towards is extending that prediction window from four weeks up to eight weeks. And if you're able to do that, then you can start to target vaccinations to the region as well, which is truly could have huge potential to limit the outbreak of this disease. And of course, there's been interest in applying this sort of modeling techniques to a whole range of diseases worldwide as well. So that's a couple of real life examples, but at the moment they're on, I guess, a smaller scale, 27 hospitals in Australia, one particular disease in, in a country. And so if we want to scale up these models in order to help forecast demand for healthcare and healthcare needs across entire health systems, there's a few challenges I think we're likely to need to overcome. And I think we've discussed some of these already this morning, but I'll focus in on some of these at a high level. So the first one is interoperable multi-source data systems. So we need data that's able to flow around the health system. So you need to be able to pool your health service data with your everyday data, with your genomic data, to create that rounded view of an individual, and potentially having common data standard, common data programming languages to actually exchange this across the health service is likely to be very important. And there are some projects, so I know of one, the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources Specification pro Project in the US, that's looking at defining those standards to make global standards to allow the data to flow around the system. Data privacy, so we've heard a lot this morning about data privacy, GDPR, so I won't focus specifically on the GDR requirements, but what we did hear from Andres was the challenge of data ownership, which was also really important, and I'm just thinking back to our survey at the start, we can compare this um, with a survey done by Accenture, I think this was a UK survey, which found that 90% of those surveyed would be willing to share their wearables and app data with their doctor or a member of their health team, so I think we're quite in line with that. Pretty much everyone here in this room put their hand up. They could see the benefits in that. And only 38% of people would be willing to share this data with their employer. So I think we're perhaps less trusting in this room than the, than the general public, which is, a, which is interesting. And I've got another survey here from the British Science Foundation, which is about genomic data. So staggering 95% of people would not be willing to share their genomic data with private companies. 
So although the majority of those surveyed would be willing to share this data for medical research or with their health team, 95% wouldn't want private companies having access to that data. And that would include employers as well as private insurers, financial services companies as well. So there's clearly a need that people have to take ownership of their data. So perhaps developing something like a personal patient record in order to allow people to see that data that's about them in one place and control exactly which stakeholders can access the health service parts of the data, the, the everyday data, which particular devices you can allow the different stakeholders to have access to, as well as genomic data as well, could be really an important solution to start to develop here. And I know Emma will probably share some stories um, of his work in Hong Kong around this as well later on. And the third challenge is one is of overcoming limitations in models. So we heard from Professor Mantelero about all the biases that can be present in these models. Uh, and definitely in a health context, this is very important. So at the moment, doctors, there could be a systematic bias. Perhaps a particular medical test is just used by doctors to confirm a diagnosis. Maybe it's particularly invasive, so you wouldn't want to undergo that test to confirm the diagnosis unless there was a high probability of, of that diagnosis being true. So making sure we have healthcare-specific algorithms that can adapt to some of these biases is going to be really important as well. So in the long term, if we do overcome some of these challenges, then we might have the opportunity to leverage big data across an entire health system. So I'd like to share a quick vision of that, a very um, a schematic here of how we could direct patients around the health service. So you could imagine individuals have their personal patient record and based on the data that's being collected about them, if they think that they are sick and need to go to the health service, that data, building a, a model on top of that, could help to direct people to the primary care if it's predicted that they have a much lower risk just going to their local, local doctor, or if it's predicted that they have a really acute outbreak of something and they need to go into the hospital, into that secondary care, then it could immediately direct them and, and make them aware of that as well. And pooling this data at a national level can be really valuable. So if you had, for example, a winter outbreak, a winter flu outbreak of disease, and you can forecast that and see that your demand for services is likely to rise beyond capacity. So you have the opportunity then to be proactive and potentially discharge the lowest risk patients, those that are the most clinically stable. You can discharge them back into the community under the care of their local doctor or, or local nurses as well. And so you can free up some resources to help deal with those incoming acute patients as well. And finally, for those that don't need immediate uh, attention of, of doctor or the medical profession, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity as well to use this for, for monitoring and to help prevent disease onset. So that individual patient record, it can be collating that everyday data, and you can be suggesting health improvements that people can make in order to reduce their risk of disease, particularly maybe chronic diseases or in a winter flu outbreak, if, if that's likely you could take preventative measures, perhaps you're elderly and, and flu would be very crippling to you. So you can start to take preventative measures to improve your health in that way as well. So that's uh, Pretty much what I wanted to say, I'll just leave you with this slide before I pass on to Philip to show how we have real opportunity to help build these highly responsive models. And if we can better manage those data privacy risks and those uncertainty risks when modeling with the data, then we should have the opportunity to build a health service that can respond better to healthcare needs, improving the allocation of healthcare resources, helping to forecast the capacity across the health system and also helping to improve the quality of care delivered as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, we now heard about uh, opportunities, a lot of opportunities, and it sounds great. And my role here is now uh, the one bringing the bad news, <laughs> data privacy and the general data protection regulation. Um, I will just make one bold statement, which uh, maybe we can discuss afterwards as well, um, and that is, with the current GDPR, at least in the health sector, I'm saying that you are not able to do what you would like to do in a GDPR-compliant way. 
Um, I would like to explain that a little bit, um, some background uh, from my person maybe. Um, I'm a lawyer by profession. Um, I've been practicing data privacy law now for almost six years. Uh, I've been doing that in a, in a law firm and for the last two years I joined Bayer as an in-house counsel um, and I yeah, advise uh, the company Bayer uh, which is very active in the healthcare sector and producing medicines and medical devices. Um, but also in other life sciences, that's how we call it, um, and I particular am responsible for one of our other uh, life science sectors, which is crop science. So I'm advising um, this division who helps farmers um, to, you know, maximize their yield on their, on their farms. Um, and we are too using now big data and artificial intelligence. Um, to leverage this, um, we call this digital farming. We heard about this very briefly yesterday from our colleague from Microsoft. Uh, she touched on that, so we are, we are very much involved in that one with a affiliate which is called Climate Corporation. Um, and this company is using hardware pieces as well as software. We sell this, so we don't do this for free and let us be paid by the data of the farmers, but we actually sell this as a service and farmers are able to use um, all the information that is coming from different sort of sensors, cameras, G GPS, and other things. Um, um, information they provide about their, f uh, their farm and what they are um, planting, the vegetables or crop they are using. Um, and we provide the farmer with an overview and information about the status of his farm. So our cameras can, for example, detect what he's planting, whether it lacks nutrition, whether there are some sicknesses of the plants, whether there are insects or herbicides that are unwanted. And um, we combine this information with other sources as well. So for example, weather, forecast, and um, different sorts of other uh, um, information. And together, combined um, with this very powerful, I'm not a technician, but I'm said, so told it's very powerful, um, um, yeah, uh, artificial intelligence technology, um, he's able to um, plan his, um, his farm in a very professional manner and he's able to plan with it for the next five years even um, to maximize the yield as good as possible. Um, so this area is probably not so complicated as the one we are talking about right now with the health sector. Um, and I would like to elaborate uh, my bold thesis I just uh, um, put into this room. Why is it almost impossible with the GDPR to um, have big data technologies, at least in the healthcare sector? So when you are confronted with uh, the question of your business, hey, I have this project, I would like to do this and that, um, please tell me what I need to do to be compliant. Um, one of the first questions I always ask is whether you truly have personal data or not. And that is already a very important crossroad for these kind of projects because it determines whether you need to go to that very burdensome road of having to comply with the GDPR or whether you're completely free, so to speak. I'm not touching about ethical uh, topics right now, but really just the GDPR. Um, and that is already a very tough question to answer because as m maybe most of you know, personal data is very broadly defined uh, in the law. It's any information belonging to a individual, to a natural person. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you can directly identify a person with that data set you have there or whether it's possible to do this indirectly. So with other means, with other information, even if you do not possess that yourself right now, you, if you can combine it and in theory you're able to identify the person you're talking about personal data. Um, and here's the first problem. Um, many lawyers try to advise and say, okay, uh, just anonymize this data and you're fine. Um, and that is the first problem already, because nowadays, um, I'm not a technician again, but um, I heard a lot of people that know about data science that say there is no su such thing as anonymous data anymore. Because even if you are able to aggregate information or strip data from directly identifying information, like deleting the name or the address or something like that, uh, as soon as you start to combine that data with other sources, and as we heard from Lisa, that's something that she would like to do, combined sources, um, different data sources, and let them, you know, talk to each other. As soon as you start to do that, you cannot really know whether the information you put in there, combined with the one you have, 
again, allows you to reveal the identity of the person behind that data. So that is something very difficult to do in practice, um, especially when we talk about big, da big data. Um, and there will always be a very big risk that if you want to take that path, um, that you become incompliant. Now, if you say that risk is too great, or maybe you're even, you even have to say, no, that's not possible for me. I need to have personal data because I need to know who the person is behind it because maybe, for example, I want to inform him about something that has come up with this big data analysis. I need to have personal data. Then you have to go to this burdensome road of having to comply with the GDPR. And there are four principles in the GDPR which, in my view, make it very, very hard to have a big data project compliant with the GDPR. The first one, and probably the most important in my view, is the purpose limitation. Um, it says that, first of all, when you start collecting personal data, you can only do so for um, a specific purpose. It must be legitimate, and you have to stick to that purpose during the processing. And there is one exception in the GDPR, which is quite new in comparison to the old law, it allows you to also pursue compatible pur purposes. So this gives you a little bit of flexibility, and I think this is one of the points where the lawmaker thought that he's being modern and is allowing more big data technologies, for example. But um, still, if you change that purpose, if, if you have a compatible purpose, which is not so easy in all cases as well, you need to assess this. In each and every case, you need to assess this, and this is subject to informing the data subject as well. So as soon as you start using data for another purpose, you need to inform the data subject about that. In practice, this is something that is really not easy to, to do. Um, the second, um, second uh, principle is the principle of lawfulness. It says that, in principle, you are not allowed to process personal data. That is a prohibition, unless you have a legal basis to do that. And there are two possibilities to have legal basis. The first one is consent, which we already heard about a little bit today. And the second one is there is a legal exception in the law. Now, um, the problem with consent, and we heard about this already today, this is, it's not very easy to obtain a valid consent. It starts with your consent must be informed. So the data subject really needs to understand what he's consenting to. Uh, the consent must be specific. So you cannot just obtain consent for, I want to do big data. You need to go into a little bit more detail, and the person really needs to understand what he's consenting to. So very high burdens to do this, again, in a compliant way. That's one other problem I see with many companies that just say, ah, OK, I, I just obtain consent, and it's good. Many of these consents I've seen are just not valid. And then, again, you are incompliant. Um, legal exception, in theory, sounds good for many big data technologies. This is also a possibility. It's not for all the um, projects that entail health data or, let's say, other sensitive personal data. I'm not sure if you know this, but the GDPR distinguishes between two different kinds of data, normal data and very sensitive personal data. And this sensitive personal data, health data, is amongst them. So. And what it does, the GDPR, is it limits the possibility to process this kind of personal data based on a legal exception. And you can more or less say you can only obtain consent if you want to process this sensitive personal data. And one fun fact for the data privacy nerds among you, this is not only a problem for health data. If you look at Article 9, Paragraph 1, at the very beginning, it talks about data and information you can derive from that data. This is especially applicable to information like about the race or religion. So it's prohibited to process normal personal data as long as you are able to derive the conclusion about, for example, the religion or something else. So in some cases, you can even discuss whether you are able to process a name or uh, someone who ordered food uh, and from what he ordered, you may be able to say, ah, he must be Jewish, for example. Um, although the information he ordered, I don't know, this and that kind of food, as such, is not a very sensitive information, but you, you see what I'm getting here, yeah? Um, so we call this the data's being um, infected by 
sensitive personal data. And it means um, even if you thought you could process personal data on a legal exception, and, and one very uh, popular legal exception in, in the privacy in private industry is the legitimate interest. Uh, so that is a legal exception that basically says you are allowed to process personal data if you have a legitimate interest, which is basically everything that is not illegal. Uh, and at the same time, when weighing the interests with the data subject whose de personal data you want to process, if this is not, let's say, more important than your legitimate interest. So it's a weighing of interests, and if you are able to prove that your interest is, is weighs higher, you can influence that by using technology to, um, or, or um, yeah, safeguards to make sure that this data is being more or less protected from the data subject, use pseudonyms where you can, for example, then you're able to process this personal data based on this, on this legal basis. And my thesis with big data is um, in, in very few cases, you're really able to rely on this, on this legitimate purpose um, um, exception because of the problem I just explained with the sensitive personal data. At least in the health sector, it's, you know, we don't need to start discussing it. The third um, greater problem with uh, data privacy and big data is the principle of data minimization. Uh, this principle requires you to delete personal data as soon as you don't need to, as, as you don't need it anymore for the initial purpose for which you collected it. So this uh, is closely connected to the purpose limitation I just um, explained. You need to really make sure that you at all times have a legitimate purpose. Um, backed by a, a legal basis, because if you don't, you need to delete this data. So there is no such thing as just you know, getting data as much as possible. You're going to get in this big marble rock and just putting it aside and then thinking, OK, maybe one day I could use it. I'm not sure right now, but you know, it's, it's oil. I don't waste oil. It's not, pos it's not possible with personal data. If you don't need it, you need to delete it. And the last principle is the principle of transparency. Um, and that is a big challenge in my point of view. You need to, so this principle says that you need to inform data subjects about what you will do with their personal data. And you need to do it in a way that they really understand. And uh, explaining these technologies, how they work, maybe the algorithm behind it. We heard today, for example, it would be nice uh, if every one of us could understand the algorithm behind it. I'm not sure if I want to. I think I wouldn't understand. So that is another big, uh, issue um, and yeah so there you go these are um, this is my thesis so I think uh, if you take all this together it's pretty hard to um, make make uh, a big data project in the healthcare sector GDPR fully GDPR compliant so that you as a lawyer are able to say okay there is no risk go ahead well, okay, after Philip's <laughs> statements, I think a couple of, you know, data science might leave the audience afterwards because it sounds too challenging. So you have, if you have any questions at all point of time, please just raise your hand and I will, you know, pass the mic to you to, to help you out. So I think we, we tackled quite an interesting topic right now about uh, the data privacy, also content management. And uh, with my experience, we put a couple of us, a couple of uh, clinics in Hong Kong and Taipei, in Taiwan, uh, on a system which allows you to trace basically in a, in a mutable database all the actions and give the rights of controlling the each data item who at what point of time uses it to the patient. But the problem that we encountered is basically that um, people, a majority of people do not care and do not understand the value of the data and basically do not care who process their health data at this point of time. Because if, if, we, if we look at ourselves and the uh, also, we have GDPR, but the clinics already are selling and doing data brokerage right now. So basically, if you go into, if I'm going to the lab to have a, my blood test, for example, given, I will receive a paper with some metrics, but probably my, my blood test analytics will be, would be sold via the data brokers to insurance companies, to pharmas, to biotech companies. And this is a very interesting aspect. We're still speaking about, you know, data freedom and speaking about the, the rights and the mechanism, how we can control and uh, hold the data, but still people do not get a thing about whether there is some value or not. And this is an interesting question I, I would like to ask to Lisa. So you, you work in an insurance policy making, and uh, how, is, how, do you, how do you basically, um, so w we already uh, discussed this question yesterday about basically uh, you do not do this 
uh, based on individuals, the analytics about the health condition, for example, the relative's condition. So how does this sound from a data privacy and also ethical point of view? If, for example, we would, you know, algorithmical way, if we see that people are in the risk group of cancer, we should probably put a higher, higher amount of money to pay for insurance policy. But whether this is ethical or not, this is a quite an interesting question, in my opinion. So uh, what, what do you think? How can we basically bring the value and both, you know, holding the ethical ethical metrics there for the for the patients. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting challenge, particularly, you know, in the UK, of course, it has to comply with all all the GDPR requirements that Philip mentioned. So it's hard to unlock that value of of the data in terms of, you know, using it to help prevent disease in that specific privatized health insurance context. Of course, dealing with sensitive data, we have to comply fully with GDPR. I think if we could you know, advance the regulation, maybe put people in better ownership and start to educate people about exactly how their data is being used, then you can maybe get to that high level vision that I presented, that diagram. I think that's a very long term vision, but there can be real value even in completely unidentifiable data. So in France, uh, there was an example that I've come across where it was prohibited to collect that admissions data in a way that could identify a person. So in a way that could tell you what condition they had, who they were, but even just by knowing the number of people coming at what times in the hospital, they were still able to build a really predictive model to just forecast the flow of patients and the number of patients coming. So you can still do some quite useful modeling from sort of an overall health systems perspective. If we want to start to unlock that value to help, you know, drive behavioral change perhaps and to start improving people and preventing disease, then I think, you know, we might need the regulatory landscape to evolve to allow us to do that and that's going to start by educating people so they can understand what they're signing up to because until we do that we're not going to be able to you know derive all this fantastic benefit that we have potentially to unlock in the data. It's not only about healthcare for sure so uh, it's uh, for whole uh, life science sector also crop and crop sciences and, uh, and agriculture but basically in order to educate people we should basically s show some kind of a uh, uh, short-term value. Lisa spoke about the long-term value that we can basically correlate the data such as genomic data, phenotypic data, blood tests, wearable data, etc., etc., to correlate and see the risk factors and do the preventive healthcare. But it's still not there. So basically, if we, if we have a stereotype of, you know, companies already knowing how to do the great stuff in order to treat and cure people, you know, but, but, but basically they lack data, that's not true. So basically there are organizations such as hospitals holding an enormous amount of data and still do, do not doing any processing there. And for the, for the patient view, like for the stakeholders view, uh, just a great example I think of the wearable devices. So uh, how many of you do have some wearable device that tracks your health data? Okay. <laughs> I'll raise the hand as well too. <laughs> it's a little bit, uh, have a bigger, broader audience. But basically, if, if we have just a simple app, which is like cardiogram or uh, heartbeat monitoring, like it just, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of, a lot of systems propose that we should, we should gather as much data as we can to show it both to the patient, to the doctor. But from one point of view, people like, like myself, I'm not, you know, having the, the right direct value from the same pulse I have. Okay, I do understand that zero means I'm dead. 250 means I will die in a couple of minutes, so I pr should probably call the ambulance. What happens, you know, between these mid metrics, if my, my pulse now is like 71, for example, 72, it do does not give me any, you know, short-term value and short-term incentive to provide and, you know, participate in the study and get more data on the table. From another point of view, systems, like IT systems, proposing that we should harvest as much data as we can to show it to the, to the hospital worker, to the clinician, to make, you know, the things happening and to provide additional value. But what happens in real life, if we just put this, you know, ocean of data on top of the table, meaning that, you know, thousands of, or uh, ten thousands of data points on the same screen, clinicians would not just take it because they have around 20, 30 minutes of the examination of the patient. So, you know, time, time flies quite fast. So we basically should understand what matters among this noise. It's very, I think, in my, my opinion, it's a very interesting point that we, we, can, we can tackle here. So... Um, any questions, audience? Yeah, sure, pass the mic. Thank you very much for the interesting uh, discussion. We can see a lot of benefits, I think, to using the information, particularly hospitals, healthcare facilities. I'm very intrigued by this concept of employers because you mentioned that people don't seem to care who's getting the information or maybe they're just not so worried, but 
I can think of at least 100 different types of information that people would probably prefer that their employers not have access to. And I can think of 100 different scenarios where information about the healthcare condition of an employee could be used to the disadvantage of that employee. And I see really no advantages. So why is it that people won't distinguish between sharing information with a medical system that could help you know, plan the utilization of hospitals and deployment of nurses or doctors, as opposed to sharing information with their employer who could, in some countries, have the right to fire them immediately without uh, any uh, you know, cause or justification? I think that's really interesting, and I'm sure there'll be, you know, a, a really strong like GDPR regulation angle that that Philip can bring to this. From my perspective, yeah, there's huge potential and negative consequences of sharing very sensitive information with, you know, an employer, a private company like your your bank. Um, but I have heard of a few positive examples. So there are some employers out there that are partnering up with health companies. I've heard of some some U.S. examples to actually help drive their whole workforce to become healthier. So giving everyone, for example, a free um, wearable tracker or incentives to use the gym and then collecting the data that way. I suppose you have to then have that trust in the, in the relationship that you can trust that your employer is not going to use that data against you. Maybe it's part of the confidentiality and the, and the consent process. But I think there are some, some employers out there that are looking to potentially collect that data or support their workforce to become healthier but you're always going to have that flip side where it could be used for, so for some negative consequences against you as well. So I think there's, there's a real challenge there to make sure people understand exactly how their employer or a private company is going to use their data and that that's only going to be a force for good and that there's all this risk management processes in place to stop that from being used against an individual, either consciously or subconsciously as well. I don't know if there's a regulatory view on them. Um, yeah, I, I, yes. I'm very skeptical from a legal point of view <laughs> doing that. At, at, at least if the employer would ask their employees to provide that information, I think there is no real, yeah, probably no legal way to do this because um, we're talking about health data again, so the employer could not rely on a statutory permission, so he would need to obtain consent from his employees. And that's one of the issues already. You, as an employee, you know, the consent must be freely given. If you as an employee are being asked by your employer, hey, please provide me at all times with, via a tracker with your health data, uh, how free is the employee in saying yes or no? Uh, so that's why in most cases, um, employees are not able to give a valid consent vis-a-vis -vis their employer. Uh, so I. I have difficulties uh, seeing how this could be done even in a compliant way. And it could also raise a lot of legal issues. We might get some work, uh, additional work for lawyers in the legal profession in this. Yeah, I would love But that. we can see a lot of scenarios. <laughs> we talked about the algorithms, but there are certain, for example, certain uh, health conditions that affect certain minority groups, certain ethnic groups, certain genetic conditions. And that kind of information would end up uh, affecting who's being uh, employed and, and mm -hmm. it could have negative consequences for, for individuals and members of different groups and people who have certain types of lifestyle. And uh, I think it would be a very rich field for litigation. So this could be good for the lawyers in the future. There, there is actually a benefit. Like we, we, we had one, one case study with one of our partners uh, back in, in China big company and they, they uh, tried to aggregate health data from the employees and they say, hey, we would like also to match this with the social data from social media to make, uh, because, because the, how, how they said that, because they, they, they do believe that <coughs> this can give them, you know, more understanding about the risk of health. But, you know, from one point of view, it sounds quite, you know, good for the uh, employee to have, I don't know, for example, some kind of, you know, preventive health care by employers saying, hey, hey, man, go to the lab. This is 10 bucks. Go and do the blood test. And uh, it's on us. But from another point of view, this gives quite a lot of, you know, quite a, quite a deep dive of the, your employer into your life, basically understanding all of your activities and all of your stuff. Because they, their case study in the end of the day was because uh, they wanted to do this risk assessment of the potential employees and also employees that are doing the job at the company. And that was quite, you know, quite interesting from a technical point of view, but quite, you know, a little bit, yeah, freaking from a, from a, personal being yet. 
question over there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I will again start with the statement that I'm not a lawyer, but Philip, your, one of your statements draw my attention and also confusion. Uh, you talked about like uh, the mm, all institutions who are gathering the data, they should delete the data once they are finished with the task they gather it for. So especially with the healthcare data, my doctor is like storing data from my blood analysis from 10 years ago. And uh, well, with direct purpose uh, for those analysis, it's it's ended. It, it is no more needed, but for example, today it's, it's uh, it's good to look back on retrospect to what, what happened there, and maybe that gives some clue about the st status today. So with this uh, law uh, implications, I would not want to lose uh, some information that could be uh, useful today, and not knowing at that point that it is useful. So uh, can, can you clarify a bit more uh, why I'm yeah, confused sure. about this one? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so. Um, that's the principle, right? You have to delete the data as soon as you don't need it for the initial purpose. Of course, there are laws that, for example, require you to store personal data for, or not specific personal data, but in general. For example, tax laws uh, require companies to store um, information about their customers or um, about contracts that they entered into, um, where they gained money and so on then you need to store it at least in Germany for, for example, 10 years so that the tax uh, um, authorities are able to revise it, right? So there are some laws, sp specific laws that require to store personal data for specific reasons. And in this case, the GDPR says, okay, that we allow that, of course, yeah? So um, I'm not sure, I'm not a specialist in this healthcare sector law, so I'm not sure whether there are laws that maybe even require a an, an, an healthcare professional to store your data for, I don't know, 10 years, because it's maybe needed um, to, um, I don't know, to, to show that he did his, his uh, job right, to, um, to have this information because it's relevant to your health in the future. So it, it might well be that there are laws that, that, re that allow an HCP, a um, healthcare professional, to do that. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, so could I conclude from your answer that for each new use case that there would be, we would need new specific law? Uh, to store that data longer than it's... Yes, uh, because the general rule in the GDPR says delete it if you don't need it anymore and if there is no law that requires you to store it. So you need to have a close look in each and every case. You have to look at the data. You have to look at the purpose. Everything is connected to a purpose in data privacy law. You have to look at the purpose and then you are able to determine whether there is a law that requires you to store this data even beyond the initial purpose for which it was collected or, or not. And if not, you need to delete it, and that, that's a consequence, but not only in, f in this example you have there, but um, I have other examples in my company where um, my business uh, says, hey, uh, this, this is valuable information, why should we delete it? Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I say, sorry, I, I have no means. I, can, I cannot tell you anything else. I don't have a law that would require uh, to have this data anymore, and if, if the data subject doesn't want us to have this, and, and you, you couldn't even ask for consent from the individual. So, because this consent would again be invalid, it needs to be specific. So you cannot just say, hey, give me your consent for storing your data for the next 20 years. I don't know for what purpose. Maybe I will need it someday, maybe not. It, it, it's could, it could be worth, worthy something. We don't know right now. A, a consent like that wouldn't be valid. Mm -hmm. So not even the data subject, the individual, you yourself could say, I, please don't do it. You could say, give me that data so I can have it, <laughs> and then I store it. So we still have more questions than answers once again. So from a healthcare perspective, yeah, you know, uh, w once again, we still do not know the exact price and exact value of data, but we do know that, you know, just one data point on the timeline means just a little. Like, if, if I will, like, go to pharma now and say, hey, guys, please buy my blood test, I just gave it today, the price of it is, you know, near zero. But if we combine this, we had one pilot basically combining selfies with blood tests, which is quite, you know, quite a common thing, like doing selfies, especially on Instagram or social networks. And the selfie itself costs nothing. But if you correlate this and combine it with the blood test in a, in a longer period of time, it might mean quite a lot because you can do skin analytics, you can do the blood flow analytics, you can see emotions, you can see aging and this kind of stuff being correlated by blood test metrics. But uh, yeah, once again, if you, if you store this information, if you anonymize this information, still it can lead, 
maybe indirectly, but it, it can lead to a certain individual. Like it's the same thing if I would say like, you know, some, some, someone in this, in this building might have cancer in 10 years. And you know, you, you will be like looking around saying, okay, hmm, who this might be? Yeah, sorry for this horrible example, but still, once again, this is indirectly pointing at a certain, certain individual. And also, and so, 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 so points basically going not into GDPR compliance. That's quite an interesting case. I think it was one, one more question somewhere there. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's not a question, it's a, it's a comment. Uh, because uh, I also give legal advice and I was involved in a big project, uh, it's a European funded project on uh, uh, smart factories. And uh, we use uh, smart devices uh, applied in the factories uh, to the workers. And uh, I think that, uh, like I <laughs> tell to my students in many cases, uh, the answer, the best answer for, from a lawyer and from a, a legal uh, scholar is it depends. It depends. <laughs> okay? So it means uh, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't want to say that it's not the black and white. Uh, uh, for instance, if you use uh, pseudonymization, if you use uh, anonymization, and in certain ca cases it's possible to have anonymization or anonymous data, you can also use a device that collect information, that collect information about the workers. Also because there is not only consent, but there is also legitimate interest, uh, and there are some specific laws, uh, for instance, in terms of healthcare protection of workers. So if my workers work, and that was the case, uh, with robots, and there is a human-robots interaction. Uh, the position of the worker in terms of sensor applied to the, to the suites of the workers is very important to reduce the risk to have an accident in the work. And so there is a legal ground also to have this data. Then the problem is, is you collect this data to monitor the, the performance of the worker in a legitimate manner. But this acts on the level of uh, which kind of use you made with this data. So this is only a comment uh, in order to figure out that uh, in data protection we have to have a case-by-case -case approach and focus on the specific uh, application and also taking into account all the range that the GDPR provides to us in terms of legitimate grounds, but uh, also legal grounds, sorry, but also in terms of technical solution that comes from personal data to pseudonymization data Personalized data to anonymous data to as limited data retention to a more extensive data retention. For instance, I work in a project on uh, smart uh, mobility that cover four me an area an area populated by four uh, million people, and we collect information about the the the, the people that use the public transport means. But of course, we uh, use this data to predict but uh, are no longer personal data because they are anonymized with a set of different techniques uh, that reduce the impact. So I want to only give a positive message <laughs> to the technical guys or the people that are involved in this project that, that uh, GDPR is not only a limitation or a problem. Uh, the problem is uh, having a good dialogue between the legal staff and the technical staff to find the best solution. Yeah, thank you for the comment, and that's of course true. So I'm, I try to be very broad with this. I think it was a good statement. Good statement yeah. yeah, and definitely the collaborative power. You know, if we would work to understand the GDPR, what the developers are seeking to bring out, what the public would want, and if we can work together to, you know, work out what might be be possible there, we definitely have lots of potential for for great uses of this technology as well. So let's let's end up with a quick call to action from our guest speakers. Yeah. So uh, would you like to share, you know, some kind of statement more uh, positive and <laughs> futuristic maybe oh, a more positive, challenge or challenging or challenging statement he has a call to action to go to the uh, coffee break um, yeah um, I think um, the lawmaker for the GDPR they claim that they are reacting with this law to the newly developed technologies and the new era because the old uh, directive was based in the 90s and um, technology has evolved um, and they claim that they did that with the GDPR I would say they do the poor job with that because um, as we can, could see from what I just said, at least for the health sector, technologies like big data, they, they struggle a lot with the GDPR. And um, my thesis is that um, with projects where almost every one of us would say that they benefit the society. So I think it's just too hard at some points. 
Lisa. Yeah, uh, yeah. I suppose my challenge would be that you know we need to work within the legal framework to figure out ways that we can analyze this data lawfully to bring about you know some of those great benefits that I showed on that that slide at the end of my presentation in terms of improving health systems and improving the quality of care as well. From a technical point of view, quick call to action might sound, you know, we, we in IT now try to be more uh, user-centric, finally, not just coding for coding purposes, but basically understanding how and for what purposes people would use this technology. So in, in my case, the call to action would be, you know, to work more on education of society. So basically, because they, that, therefore the integration would be there. But now, when people do not understand the value beneath, do not treat the data as the value they have, they produce, this kind of, you know, hard to speak about all of the data privacy, all of the transparency of the process, what people do not care. So uh, the quick call to action will be also educate, work, analyze, and work in the law-specific things to make the things happen. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, Lisa, and Demiel.